There we are. All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today, a little bit of all three of those. It's super exciting, and we are so happy that you could join us as we continue our series with the Toronto Zoo. So every single Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, we've been featuring amazing stories from the Toronto Zoo, everything from polar bears to Komodo dragons, tigers, tree kangaroos, and so much more. So thank you for joining us uh, and highlighting the amazing education work that they're doing. We've got some live groups with us today. We've got teachers from across Ontario and a student joining us all the way in Kilgore, Texas, which is really exciting. And a huge hello to all our groups on YouTube as well. Before we dive in, one quick housekeeping note. Uh, if you want to join us on the Slido app, I will type this in the YouTube chat bar. You can go to Slido and use the event code WILDLIFE and that will get you in to take part in quizzes, games, and polls. So please do do that if you get a chance. All right, without further ado, today we are in a very special part of the Toronto Zoo. Previously, we've been in all places where the public can go visit, and today we are in the Wildlife Health Centre. So this is a fairly new part of the Toronto Zoo, and it's an area where you can learn about how they take care of over 5,000 animals that live at the zoo. I'm really excited to check it out, and without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Mary Ellen, and take us away. Alrighty, hi guys, thank you Jesse. So like you were saying, my name is Mary Ellen. I'm a programs coordinator here at the Toronto Zoo and I'm very excited to have you guys joining me here in our Wildlife Health Center. So while the Toronto Zoo is currently closed to the public right now, that doesn't mean we have stopped caring for the 5,000 animals who call our zoo their home. And today while we're in the House Sound Health Center, we're gonna learn a little bit more about how we're able to care for those animals if they ever get sick, what kind of foods they're getting, and all of our amazing, wonderful staff and volunteers who are here all the time taking care of them and keeping our site up to date and ready for the public to come visit. Before we get into our topic, I'm gonna to bring out our riddle of the day today. So just like in our past videos, we have our riddle here. We're gonna read it out together. I'll give you a little hint on it. And then at some point while I'm talking today, I will be saying the answer to this riddle. If you think you know the answer, you can write it in one of the chat bars uh, or Slido. Um, and then if you get it right first, Jesse's gonna give you a shout out at the end of the video. So today the riddle is, when you need to know how things are going, just look to me and see if I'm showing. I want a home that's nice and that's healthy and clean. The people who change it seem pretty mean. So this is our riddle for today. I'll give you guys a hint. It's not gonna be an individual animal. So it's never gonna be like a polar bear or anything like that. It's gonna be a word that I use to describe a bunch of animals. It might be more of a scientific word as well that you may not have heard before. All right, so I'll give you guys a couple more seconds with it. And then we will start our Wildlife Health Center journey. Alrighty, so like I said, this is the Wildlife Health Center and there's actually so much more to this building. Currently, we are standing in the gallery section. So this is actually an area that is open to the public. So when we do reopen, feel free to come on by. We usually have one of our amazing volunteers stationed in this building as well. And they can help guide you through uh, some of the cool behind the scenes that go on here and help introduce you to some of our uh, rooms that we have where we do of our, our amazing testing and taking care of our animals. Right beside this building as well is actually our greenhouse pavilion. Um, and in our greenhouse, you're able to walk through and see all the plants that we grow here at the zoo for decorative purposes. So we have lots of, uh, if you go into our pavilions, you'll see lots of nice trees and plants that are native to those areas of the world. But we also grow quite a bit of food for our animals as well. And that's one of the things that people don't always understand. Come on over with me. I'm going to teach you guys one of the uh, sayings that we say here at the zoo is that what you see at the zoo is just the tip of the iceberg. And what I mean by that, if you're here with your family and you're looking at our polar bear exhibit, you're going to see our five polar bears that we have at the Toronto Zoo. They're really cool. I implore you to come and see them when we do reopen. Juno, Nikita, Aurora, Humphrey, and Hudson, they are such characters. We've actually done a video where Juno kind of stole the show in our question and answer period. If you look back in our playlist on Explore by the Seed Your Chance and go to the Seasonal Changes video, you can catch uh, some really cool action shots of Juno swimming there. But when you're here, you're just seeing our polar bears. What you guys don't see is everything underneath the surface of the water, the rest of the iceberg, as we call it. And that's the research, nutrition, health science, conservation, and education that go into each of our exhibits and our animals every single day. And we're not alone in doing this. Here at the zoo, we have a dedicated team of staff 
from nutrition to horticulture uh, to maintenance, facilities, zookeepers, education staff like myself. And we also have over 400 volunteers who work year round here to help guide our public through um, and make a lot of really cool interpretive experiences for our guests as they come through the zoo as well. So there's so much more to it. Some of our really cool rooms we're about to see in a second are more of our surgical suites. So where we can do uh, laboratory experiments and things like that to make sure our animals are staying healthy. Some of the other things we do that you're not able to see in this building uh, right now is our nutrition center where we actually prepare all the food for our animals. And we're gonna see a short video on that in just a second. Another cool, really cool area of the zoo and that it is unfortunately closed to the public viewing is part of our conservation breeding programs. And this is something we're dedicated here at the zoo to do. Uh, we've talked in previous videos about SSPs, so species survival plans, and the red list. So in our rhinos video that we did, we showed our big red list, and it pinpoints where animals fall on that list if they're not doing so well in the wild. So their numbers are getting a little bit low. Some of the cool conservation programs we do here is we help breed animals and then release them back into the wild to try and get their genetics healthy in the wild and bring up their population numbers. One of those animals that we do this for is called the black-footed ferret. We do have one on exhibit in the America's Pavilion. If you ever come here when we're open, you can check it out there. Um, but the black-footed ferret is a uh, type of ferret that is native to North America. So it's found in Alberta and also in parts of the state. And unfortunately, they are not doing very well in the wild right now. For a while, they were actually considered extinct in the wild. But luckily, a small grouping of them was found. They were brought into captivity, and places like uh, accredited places like the Toronto Zoo uh, were brought in to help breed these ferrets and then release them back into the wild. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. Animals are actually an indicator of the health of an environment. So we call these animals that we look at an indicator species. A lot of amphibians are also considered indicator species. If you see them in their habitat, it means that the habitat is healthy. As soon as they start disappearing and you can't see them anymore, they're harder to find, their numbers are dropping and that usually indicates that that habitat is becoming unhealthy and we need to change our ways and step in and give it a hand so that those animals can return to their natural habitats. All right, I'm gonna turn the camera over this way. We're gonna start looking at each of our treatment rooms here. So there's several giant windows that you can see when you come into our health center um, and you're able to kind of get a peek inside about what some of our scientists will be working on. Our first three rooms here deal with um, what I like to call maybe the grosser part of things, but animal grossology is super cool anyway. Um, it's the things that come out of animals, we'll say it that way. So we're talking about fecal samples, urine samples, and also blood analysis. Now these are really important for us because uh, looking at those three types of samples can tell us pretty much everything about an animal that we need to know. It can tell us their sex or their gender, it can tell us if they're healthy or not, if they're pregnant or not, if they're going to get pregnant, or if something is wrong with them. So we're able to collect these kind of samples from all of our animals um, and use them here with all of our equipment behind me and do lab analysis on them to make sure that our animals are staying healthy or if there's something wrong, we figure out what is wrong to make them healthy afterwards. So this is just one example of it. We'll head over to our next room over this way. So each one kind of has its own area. So we have a blood room, we have a urine room, and we do have a fecal room. And one of the really interesting parts of this is when you think about it, we've talked before that sometimes in an exhibit, there's multiple animals living together in the exhibit. And that can get a little bit confusing when you're trying to pick up fecal samples. It's not the same for a human. You can't explain to an animal, I need this sample from you, I need you to sit still, or I need you to poop in this specific corner. It's not as easy as that as it might be for humans to communicate with each other. So we have to think of some pretty creative ways uh, to be able to collect samples. And we're gonna talk about the training methods that we use uh, to collect samples from animals in just a moment. Uh, but one way that we can collect fecal samples really easily is animals who are living in a group, we give them a little bit something extra in their morning uh, food. They will actually get a little glitter pill. And we can be as specific as we can give each animal that we wanna take a sample from a different color of glitter. Um, so in this particular case, this animal was given blue glitter. 
And later in the day, when the keeper goes to clean up the exhibit, they are able to tell which fecal dropping came from the animal that they're specifically looking for because that dropping will have glitter in it. So they're able to match that to the specific animal. They're able to bring it into the lab. And now the staff here are able to test it for any diseases or uh, parasites or anything like that in it. All right, one other thing that we're able to do for these labs is help uh, with species uh, survival and uh, looking for uh, genetic health of a species as well. So I was mentioning before um, that we are able to take uh, samples from them and that doesn't just include the blood, fecal, and urine samples. Uh, we're also able to take um, samples uh, like semen and eggs and things like that from animals. And we can actually do artificial uh, insemination with these animals and help them uh, to protect their species. So unfortunately our video is not cooperating with us right now, but I'll have you guys zoom in down here to take a look at some of our nitrogen tanks. So this is actually how we're able to store and preserve uh, semen samples from our male animals that we have here. And this is really actually incredible technology. We're able to store these genetic uh, species in these tanks and then bring them out at a later date when we need to use them. So for example, there was actually uh, a couple years ago, 30 year old bison semen was successfully used and planted in a female bison who is living today um, and produced successful offspring. So the bison that donated his sample in the beginning, he was no longer with us, but he had great genetics. And we wanted to keep that up throughout the population and throughout the species in the future. And why do we care about the genetics? Well, the genetics of animals uh, dictate how good they are at surviving. So all those different adaptations and creature features, we want them to be diverse as possible. The more diverse an animal is, or the more diverse a species is, the stronger it is against uh, diseases or any changes to its habitat. So we want to make sure that they have the best genetics possible when we are able to put them back out into the wild. All right, we're going to keep going down this way, and we're going to catch a sneak peek here at uh, one of our other videos. This is highlighting uh, part of our nutrition center here. So I mentioned that we do have a nutrition center where we prepare all the food for our animals. This is some meat getting weighed out in a baggie. Uh, we always get questions in our videos about what do our animals eat while they're here at the zoo. Um, and they eat a variety of things. There's lots of meats, there's lots of vegetation and plants, um, and they are able to uh, prepare it all. This is a calcium dust that gets sprinkled on food. because We sometimes have to add supplements, just like you might take at home your vitamins or minerals in the morning. We make sure our animals get all they need there. These are our golden lion tamarins. You might have recognized them uh, getting some little snacks there as well. All right, come on down, we're going to move to our next room here. This is our water analysis room. So we've had a couple of videos that we've done in the past uh, where we've looked at some of our tanks that we've had. And we've also had questions about how many fish do we have in the Toronto Zoo? Well, I have a bit of a more specific answer for us. We have about 200 different aquatic species at the zoo currently. And all those species require their own tanks and water quality and different water quality. So some are fresh water, some are salt water, and they need to be cared for in different ways. You might also remember while we were in Indo-Malaya Pavilion a couple of weeks ago during our uh, habitats video there, we got a question about our orangutans and if they can swim in their moat. So no, orangutans cannot swim, but we were pointed out that there is a moat in their exhibit. And actually a lot of our exhibits have a water feature of some sort, not just for the animal to be able to drink water as it is a basic need, but sometimes there's like a waterfall or a stream or a moat running through their uh, exhibit. And we need to make sure that the quality of that water is still healthy for them in case they ingest it. So we're looking for things like algae growth, any bacteria, and for saltwater and freshwater tanks, we're looking at the mineral content. A lot of creatures who live um, in water all the time, they're very uh, finicky and they need very specific water temperatures and uh, mineral levels in there to make sure that they're able to properly survive. All right, so as we keep going down this way, um, we're gonna get a little closer. This is actually one of our black-footed ferrets uh, being knocked out right now just for a little bit of a treatment here. Um, so they're checking him out. The little gel they're putting in his eyes just to make sure his eyes don't dry out. All right, we're gonna keep coming down. Our next two big rooms here, these are our surgery and treatment rooms. So these are really cool areas. This is where we're able to do big surgeries on our animals. And the one over here is where we do our checkups and our, um, you know, uh, like daily checkups that we can do on them 
and making sure they're just uh, healthy, checking heartbeat, uh, looking at their eyes, their feet, that sort of thing. There's actually a great video right here. I always like to point it out. You can see that a fish is actually getting a checkup here. Um, so we actually have a wet table, which allows it to be quite moist for them so that they are able to uh, continue being cared for, even though they are an animal who needs the water. But I also just like to point out that this showcases that here at the Toronto Zoo, we take care of all of our animals, no matter how big or small. They are all very important to us from the littlest of fish. And I believe the next video coming up is actually a lion getting a dental surgery done. Um, so we care about all of our animals here. We'll give it a second to see if we can get the lion to video to come up here. And I'll make another note here. So this fish, obviously bringing a fish to the health center is very easy. Take a little net, put it in a little tank and we drive it on over. Some other animals are not so easy. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we were in the Rhino Pavilion and we met Ashakiri and Vishnu and Kiran, and they are about 4,000 pounds a piece. I definitely can't lift that. I don't think a hundred people could lift that all together. So for some of our larger animals, we actually have to go and make home calls to them and we go to their exhibit to take care of them instead. So some of them are able to come here and then some of them are we go to them. We'll pop back in and see if we can get the tie or the lion video to come back up. We just have one more room we're going to talk about and then we have a very special surprise for you guys. Alrighty, so our last room down here at the end is our uh, imaging room. So this is a room where we're able to look at animals and tell anything that's wrong about them, uh, hopefully before we have to go in and investigate in a deeper level. So in here we can take x-rays and ultrasounds. So there we can look at things like uh, the animal's bones or any of their uh, organs, see if there's anything wrong. We can also do CT scans and MRI scans. We don't do them here. We have a couple facilities outside of the zoo that we're partnered with who are equipped to actually care for animals and some places humans as well. Um, we can take them to get better imaging uh, for maybe brain or spinal cord injuries or anything like that that we need to check out. We're also not uh, new to uh, bringing in people to come and help us. So any animal who needs maybe a specialist or anything like that, we're able to bring in uh, other doctors from outside the zoo to come and help us. All right, so our last thing we're gonna to touch on before our very special surprise here Mary um, Ellen, sorry uh, to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt, ladies. Oh, your video is yeah. back. It was gone for a second there. I just wanted to make sure you were good with video. Okay, perfect. We're all, back. We're all good. Yep, you're set. Okay, perfect. So we're actually about to meet two um, animals we've brought in today and some of their keepers that are here. And I mentioned earlier that we do have a dedicated uh, keeper staff and they are some of the most important people for the health of the animal. Not only do they care for and clean the animal and feed them every day, they're actually the ones who notice things about the animals themselves. So our uh, vet staff here are really good at fixing the animal or helping them once they've noticed an illness, but it's our keepers themselves who are noticing those things. They're interacting, they know our animals' personalities, uh, their weight, everything like that, and how much they might like to eat in a day. And they're the ones who are able to really get in close and understand what might be wrong with them. All right, before we bring out our special surprise, Jesse, did anyone get our riddle of the day? Yeah, so on Slido, a lot of people got it, but very first was Violet from Windsor who got indicator species. So congrats to Violet, good job, you nailed it. There we go, that's awesome. Alrighty guys, so before we go, um, we're gonna get some Q and A's in just a few minutes, but we have brought in two very special uh, animal guests here uh, with Ashley and Rebecca. And so we are going to introduce you guys uh, to them right now. Hi. Hi. So my name is Ashley and this is Rebecca, my coworker. And we are here with Blue, the blue and gold macaw. And that over there is Molly, he's a green wing macaw. Now Rebecca and I both work in the outreach and discovery area here at the Toronto Zoo. So that means that we get to bring birds like this out to meet the public. We also do the shows in the Waterside Theatre that some people may have come to see. Uh, so we have a really interesting job. Now, macaws like this can actually live over 100 years sometimes. So a macaw the size of Blue here will live to be usually into his 60s. Uh, and a macaw like Molly, our green macaw, will live to be into his 80s. So a lot of the times when people think that they want a macaw as a pet, they're not actually thinking that they might end up with them until they're 80 years old. So that's something to keep in mind. They're also very loud, even though these two don't seem to be making any noises right now. Uh, and they're very destructive. So always keep that in mind when you're choosing something like this as a pet. Now something I think is really interesting about macaws like this is the black feathers that they have on their face. So it kind of looks like they have black lines on that white on their face. 
And those are actually little tiny feathers and no two macaws have the same pattern like that on their face. So it's a lot like a fingerprint for humans. And if you have two or three macaws that all look the same, you can actually tell them apart by those patterns on their faces. Now macaws like this actually live down in Central and South America. Uh, and you would wonder how they would be able to blend in with these bright colors. But because everything down there is so bright and vibrant, it's actually pretty easy for them to blend in. These guys tend to like to eat nuts and seeds. You can see Molly is eating some nuts over there. That's what we like to reward them with when we do training. Um, and in the wild, they'll also eat things like fruits and vegetables. But interestingly enough, they'll also eat small mammals and reptile eggs as well. So they're not strict herbivores, these guys. Now, Rebecca and I are both here to take any questions that people might have. So are there any questions? Fantastic. Well, uh, I bet there's going to be a lot of bird questions now. We've derailed it entirely with macaws. We've had 100 people write birdie and awe in the last few seconds of YouTube, so way to go. Um, so yes, uh, everyone, we are going to dive with Q&A, and so you can type in questions on YouTube. Just let me know where you're joining from. Go on Slido and share questions there, and of course, I'm going to come to all our live groups for some questions as well. I want to start, uh, you know, to make sure that we get one question, at least in the Wildlife Health Center. Um, Juliet in Oshawa wanted to know, what kind of sicknesses do the animals that come into your health center have? Oh, what kind of illnesses do the animals in the health center have? Yeah. It can be pretty much anything. So it can be something from tooth decay, or they've got something stuck between their teeth and they need some sort of dental work. Um, they can have, some animals can actually get a cold or the flu like we can. Sometimes it can be an injury, something like an injured paw or an injured wing or something like that. So it could be just about anything. It's really hard to narrow down exactly what, what kind of illnesses they would all have. Anything that can happen to people can happen to animals. And of course, even more of us, there's so many different species that you guys have there. Fantastic. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna to go to Amelia joining us all the way in Texas. So if Amelia has a question, uh, let's go to her and uh, let us know, Amelia, what do you think? Do you have any questions for us today? Um, how many species do are there of, um, of birds, I think? Yeah. At the zoo? At the zoo. At the zoo, thanks so much, guys. What species of birds are there? I have no idea. Well, <laughs> um, we have to go through and kind of count each individual one, but there's about 450 different species entirely at the zoo. And I mentioned earlier, there's about 200 of them are different aquatic species. And there's about 5,000 animals overall. So I'd say there's at least probably 50 or so different species of birds I'd estimate here at the zoo. Very, very cool. And in our last session with the Toronto Zoo, they highlighted that in every one of the pavilions, there's a free fly area where the birds just fly around. So if you ever come to the Toronto Zoo and you get a chance, you'll see some really amazing birds right up close and personal. It's a really cool experience. All right, let me go to Mr. Hill. If you have a question from one of your students, uh, go for it. Come on up and let's just demute your mic. I'll be set. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Perfect. All right. Hi, Jesse. Um, Ava wants to know how on earth are those macaws so colorful? Uh, <laughs> color in their feathers. They're just beautiful. Yeah. They are very beautiful. Um, honestly, it's just they're just kind of born that way. So each different breed of macaw has different coloring. Something like a hyacinth macaw is almost like a purple. It's so dark blue. It's really, really pretty. Um, and so they're all just colored a little bit differently. And it's kind of like people, how we all look different and we all have brown hair or brown eyes or blue eyes. It's the same thing with macaws. They all just get those beautiful colors from nature. Fantastic. Uh, we got another quick question uh, from Slido from Genevieve in Oshawa. And she wants to know, why do they have such a pointy beak? It's very prominent. <laughs> That's a great question. So macaws actually use their pointy beaks for a few different things. Um, their beaks are so strong that they can actually bite through a broom handle in one bite. So in the wild that helps them, they could bite through a coconut. Um, it also helps them with those really tough nuts and seeds and things, they can break through that. But something that's really interesting is macaws will actually use those beaks to scrape the clay off of the side of like clay walls and places they'll find in nature. Um, and they'll scrape pieces of clay off and they'll eat the clay. And then the clay actually helps to neutralize any toxins from any fruits or vegetables they may have eaten that's not good for their stomachs. Um, and it also gives them some extra vitamin B uh, to help them survive longer. Super cool. A lot of nature documentaries like Planet Earth show macaws going to these clay cliffs. It's a really cool experience. I encourage you to check that out on YouTube. All right, let's go to Miss McLaughlin uh, joining us. If you have a question for one of your students, go for it. 
I do. Um, this is from Tessa in grade six at Greekview. And she wanted to know if at the zoo, is there a special place where the newborn or the young animals are that keeps them safe? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on the species of newborn. But here at the zoo, we try to make sure that our newborns stay with their moms if it's possible. So to keep them safe, the best thing for them is to stay with the mother. Uh, so wherever they were born and wherever the mother is, that's usually where the newborn will end up staying. Fantastic. All right, another question solely about our macaws from Satara, who's turning seven today. And so happy birthday to you, Satara. Who's been joining us all month long for zoo sessions. So huge animal fan. And she wants to know, how do you tell if a macaw is sick, specifically the macaw? That's a great question. Um, so our macaws, both Molly and Blue, get weighed every single day. So one of the things that we're looking for is, is fluctuation in their weight, because if their weight is dropping, but they're still eating the same amount, that could indicate that they're sick. Um, if their weight goes up really quickly and they're still eating the same amount, that could indicate that they're sick. Um, eating more or less food might indicate that. But we also know our birds really, really well. So sometimes we'll just look at their behaviors. If they seem a little bit lethargic, they're not moving around as much as they usually do, or they're not vocalizing as much as they usually do. Things like that will usually tell us if they're sick or not. Uh, the other thing is if these two are interacting in a different way, we know what they're like when they're together. Uh, and if we see some aggression, sometimes that'll indicate a problem as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I want to go to Miss Huxley representing Queen Street Public School in Brampton. So Miss Huxley, if you have a question for us, come on up and then I'll come to you next, Amy, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, grade five uh, students here in Brampton. How often do you or do uh, different species of animals have different um, time frames with regards to checkups or um, what you're doing with them every day to make sure that they're um, super healthy? Yeah, so when it comes to vet visits for our animals, uh, the vets usually try to make sure that at least every six months they're doing a full checkup on all of our animals. So that includes any vaccinations that they need, um, anything to keep away ticks or fleas, anything like that. Um, they'll also check to make sure that their body weight is where it should be. They'll get hands on them to make sure that um, everything feels right, their muscles feel right and all of that stuff. They'll check their teeth, they'll check their eyes. Uh, and that usually happens about every six months for all of our animals. Fantastic. That's very frequent for that many animals. Very cool. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big team for that. Um, all right, we're going to go to Amy, who joined us a little bit into the presentation. So Amy, if you have a question for us, uh, let me just demute your microphone here. And uh, oh, it doesn't want to let me do that. So if your mom is nearby and help us out with getting your microphone unmuted, that would be fantastic. What I'll do is I'll come back to you in just one second and you can unmute your microphone, but I'll take a question from YouTube as we've got some great questions pouring in today. So Silas and Everett in Pulaski, Wisconsin wanted to know, where do you get your animals in the zoo from? Oh, so that's a really good question. They're all kind of a little bit different. So Molly and Blue were both uh, someone else's pets before we got them here at the zoo. Uh, and the person didn't want them anymore. So that's how we ended up with Molly and Blue. And a lot of our macaws actually at the zoo are like that. Some of our animals were born here at the zoo. Uh, and others came to us from other zoos where they were born there and they've come to us from, from those zoos, whether it's for a breeding program because we need them for the species survival plan, or if it's because sometimes other zoos will shut down and we'll get animals from there. So that's where most of our animals come from. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. All right. I love this question from another a student in Queen Street Public School. So they wanted to know if an animal has something like the flu, can they give it to the handler or to the doctor that's healing them? They actually can if they're a primate um, or there's a few select other types of animals that can do that, um, especially with things like our gorillas and our orangutans and our primates. Uh, they can give, if they have a cold, they can give it to us. But because they live here at the zoo, usually it's us giving them our illnesses. So right now with the, the COVID crisis that's going on, when we're around things like the primates, um, some of the big cats, as well as some of our weasels and our bats and pigs, we have to wear masks when we're around them. We have to make sure that we're wearing coveralls and um, gloves to make sure that we're keeping them safe as well as ourselves. Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna go back to some live groups. I'm gonna go back to Amelia for a second. If you have another question for us, come on up. Um, have you noticed any like behavioral changes uh, because nobody's coming to the zoo? Great question. Have we noticed any behavioral changes now that people aren't coming to the zoo? Is that what the question was? Yeah. Uh, actually, we have seen some behavioral changes in some of the animals. Um, our animals in outreach 
they're basically just used to us anyways, because most of the winter, the outreach section is closed. Uh, so not in our, our animals necessarily, but um, there, I know there's a hyena that really likes to have people around and they're seeing a few behavioral changes in her. Uh, we've noticed too that the tigers lately seem to like to try to hunt us because they don't necessarily have the stimulation of seeing all the people around and things like that. So when we go looking at the tigers, sometimes they're all crouched down and ready to, to pounce at us, which is kind of terrifying, but also kind of fun. So we have seen a few different behavioral changes, but nothing major, nothing that would be disruptive to their day or anything like that. Great question, great answer. I feel bad for this hyena now. We kind of want to like, you know, give <laughs> do a virtual session, say hi to the hyena. Maybe we'll schedule that in a couple of weeks. That's um, right. All right, uh, Mr. Hill, if you have a second question from your class, come on up. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, Emma from my class wants to know which animal has the biggest appetite and do you have chefs for these animals that prepare their lunches? Nice. Man, which animal has the biggest yeah. appetite? What do you think, Rebecca? You've worked with some big animals. I've only ever been in outreach. Oh, I don't know. Probably the rhinos, I would think. Rhinos yeah. are hippos. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they can eat a lot of food. <laughs> they can. Yeah. And then who prepares their food? Well, that comes down to the keepers. So Ashley and I and all the rest of the other keepers here, we're the ones that prepare the diet. We do have a commissary, which is the area that preps the food by area and sends it to us. But we are the ones that then have to prepare the diet and deliver it. That's fantastic. Thanks, ladies. All right, uh, let's go to Ms. McLaughlin. If you have a question, come on up. I do. This is from Kai. He's in grade six at Great View. And he wanted to know, what do you do with all the animals during the winter time so that they stay safe? So during the winter, some of our animals are very winter hardy. So things like the polar bears love it when it's winter time. Um, anything basically in our tundra area, they love the winter. Um, but most of our animals do have indoor spaces where they can go during the winter. But I would say the vast majority can at least be outside for part of the day because our winters are not super, super cold here. Um, as long as there's nothing like ice buildup or anything that would be dangerous for them, a lot of the times our animals can go outside for at least a little while during the day. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Amy, I really want to come to you and I see you're with your mom, so I will come back in a second. Uh, just make sure you guys know how to demute your mic or you can type in the chat bar at the bottom of the screen if you can't get the mic to work. But while you're doing that, I'll share a question from Koa online uh, who wants to know, do you ever milk snake venom in the care center? And if so, why? You've worked in the health center. We don't do that here, do we? No. No. No, so we don't ever do that, the snake milking for the venom here at the Toronto Zoo. Okay, there's no need to like, there's some, there's no need to like get rid of venom that would build up or anything like that. You just, they're totally fine by themselves. Yeah, yeah, basically we, we have a special way that we work with any of our venomous snakes um, and it's completely hands off. So we should never have our hands or any body parts around them. Uh, so because we work in that safe manner, we shouldn't need the anti-venom, but we do always have at least one anti-venom here at the zoo in case something happens and then it can go with the person to the hospital if need be. Very cool, that's good to know. How neat, guys. All right, I wanna to go to Ms. Huxley uh, and we'll take two more questions total. So Ms. Huxley, if you wanna share one with us, I'll take one um, more slide out. What, what kind of um, safety precautions are in place when you're dealing with the larger animals such as the cats and the rhinos and things like that? That's a great question for Rebecca. Rebecca actually used to be the lion and hyena keeper here. Hi. So most of most of the animals at the Toronto Zoo, we work protected contact, which means we're never occupying the same space as them. So they are in their space and we are in ours, and there is some sort of protective barrier um, in between the two. So we can still do training in between the spaces. Um, most of our animals are trained to do behaviors that enable us to take better care of them. So a lot of our bigger animals, we can train them to look into their mouths. We can train them to lie down, get weights on them on a regular basis. And species like our white rhinos are trained where we can do ultrasounds on them, which is amazing. So yeah, most of, most of the species here, especially the bigger ones, the ones that have the potential to be really dangerous, we're never going in with them. Fantastic, thanks Rebecca. All right, we're gonna take one more question. I love this question. We haven't gotten in any of our sessions so far. And it's from Caden who wants to know, how many different vaccinations do you have to give to your animals? And are they different than the vaccines we give to humans or some of the things that we would go for? That is a very complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it depends on the species. 
Um, so most of the animals that we work with uh, in outreach, they get like a dewormer, they'll get something to keep fleas and ticks away. Um, they also get a West Nile vaccine quite often. Um, but I'm sure some of the big cats probably get other vaccines, do they? Yeah, yeah, a bunch of the animals will get rabies vaccines. Um, yeah. Anything for like felid illnesses or anything? Not that I can think of. <laughs> We're not the vets. We actually <laughs> we, we have a difficult time keeping track of all of those. No worries at all. Yeah. And then the vets get them. <laughs> Fantastic. No, that's great, guys. And, and it was a really unique question. We haven't got it before. So way to go to Katie for an awesome query. Guys, we are out of time. So what I want to wrap up with, as always, is a question of where kids can go to learn more about what you guys are doing at the zoo. So what's going on and where can we keep uh, the learning going? Of course, there's so much learning to go around here at the Toronto Zoo. If you guys head over, Jesse's put the link in the description of the video uh, to the Toronto Zoo website under the parent resource tabs. There's actually at home resources that you guys can do that uh, relate to the video we've done today. Also check out the other like nine videos we've done with Explore by the Seat of Your Pants and there's resources to go with each of them. We do have a live cam set up at our uh, gorillas right now in the Rainforest Pavilion so you can go and check that out on the Toronto Zoo website as well as videos from our lemur cam we did have set up and resources that go with those for grades one to six. As well, you can follow us on all social medias. We even have TikTok, so go to Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, give us a TikTok, give us a follow. And at 1 p.m. every day here in Toronto time, we will be doing a, a Keeper live talk, a live stream on our own personal Facebook as well. And as always, we do two videos a week with Explore by the Sea of Your Pants. So check us out Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Um, and come on by and uh, see what we're going to do next week. Fantastic. Well, we've got some special things planned for next week. I really appreciate the shout out. Do check out our YouTube page, our social media as well, and donate on our website if you're keen. I want to say a huge thank you to our ladies for bringing the macaws in today too. That's so exciting. Thank you so much. They're so beautiful. All right. All right. Uh, for everyone on YouTube, over 350 people tuning in from Wisconsin, Texas, Alberta, Minnesota, and across Ontario. So a huge thanks for joining us as we continue to highlight the zoo. For now, everyone, and for our live groups, have a wonderful rest of your day. And we'll see you all soon.